Hello, welcome to Spotlight, the guiding star of creative joy on the darkest of December evenings. Spotlight, brought to you by the Isle of Man Arts Council. This evening, the latest in our profiles of Isle of Man Arts Council members. A preview of a new podcast which profiles some of the great names in the island's amateur dramatic scene. And we hear just what a great Manx Christmas custom, the Y Boys, is actually all about, I think. As always, do get in touch with any creative artistic endeavours you might be involved in, planning, hoping to create or would really like to, last time this year, folks, put in the spotlight, be they poetic, visual, theatrical, musical, literary, mime, bonkers street theatre. Just email me, spotlight at manxradio.com or howardkane at manxradio.com and there is an E on that cane. You should know that by now. Now, to kick off this last spotlight of the year, we look forward to next year. And a new podcast available via the Max Radio website. The Green Room will be a series of programmes featuring some of the best-known names in the island's Amdram scene, whether old hands or newer faces. In conversation with John Walker, a familiar face on the gaiety stage, of course, and former young actor of man, and myself. Here's a peek at the first programme. Or is it a listen? I don't know. And it features a man who's been active within drama circles for a goodly number of years perhaps more than he cares to remember here on the island, Michael Lees. He told us about the early days of MADFA, the Manx Amateur Dramatic Federation, and the beginnings of the play festivals on the island. The start of the Manx Amateur Drama Federation was in the early 1940s. Nothing to do with me, I might add. Uh, But the Easter Festival started in 1950, and the first winners were the 13 players of Bristol and the play was Canaries Sometimes Sing. So that's as far back as we go. I think there have been two instances where there was no Easter festival, but that's a pretty good record. And in 2025, we celebrate our 75th year of Easter festivals. And your, your own interest in drama, does that, does that go back as long as you can remember? Have you always been a, a drama Yes, and my first fan? interests were the Guild, and yeah. my mother used to take me along to, to watch it, and then I was performing in the Guild, and then I got involved uh, with the Legion players. Now, mad for what it is, it, it is actually a union for amateur theatre. I know it's not very politically correct these days to say anything about unions but it started really as a union to bring all the groups on the island together and each group sent two people to uh, our meetings to represent whatever group they were in that was musicals and uh, drama societies and we held our meetings fairly regularly. I, at the age of 18, uh, was the Legion Players rep and and, uh, I've been involved for 50 years now, so that's all beginning to add up. I was 12 years as the chairman and twice uh, once president. Uh, All parts of the island were represented. Some are no longer exist. People like St Mary's Players, Student Players, Raven Players, Ramsey, Mm. all gone now. After some years because it didn't begin uh, with the festival. As I say, it was in the 1940s, and that was purely to do with um, getting people involved in theatre. But after some years, it was decided to form a festival for visiting teams. Now, this is the important thing. People say, oh, yes, what was it for local teams? No, it wasn't. It was to actually encourage teams to come from across, because originally it was the tourist board, as they used to be known, who wanted to uh, involve a festival so that this would encourage people to come to the island and it worked. Um, The first one, of course, was not in the Gaiety Theatre, but in the Palace Ballroom Theatre, which, of course, is now long gone. Uh, But that's where the first one was, and then it later transferred to the Gaiety. And the first festivals, of course, were in May, to do with the May Whitson holiday, but then they transferred to Easter, and we've been at Easter ever since. Uh, That particular, when I was involved in those very early days, we were a very politically minded group. And when the gaiety came onto the open market for sale, we became the driving force to encourage the Manx government to buy the theatre. 
after many months of Timwell debating the subject, it was put through a motion to buy the Gaiety Theatre, and this was proposed by Jack Niverson. And this is the important part. It was recorded in Hansard, which is the record, of course, of Timbald, that the Gaiety Theatre would always be available for some weeks to the Amateur Theatre. So that's real gold, that the Amateur Theatre is protected by Timbald, so that we'll always be able to use the Gaiety. Which is wonderful. It's, it's really an amazing history, isn't yeah. it? That that, that um, a festival like that and and its origins, which sometimes get lost over time, people think, oh, as you say, why why don't local teams? Well, we do get local teams that that enter, but that the comment is sometimes made, oh, why why have we got more local teams? Well, it's to attract people, to, and the excitement that you get. Um, one of the things we're talking about the green room here. I mean, this is to pick up some of the conversations that we have after the Easter festival when touring players come. There's some amazing performances we've seen over the years of saying how lucky we are to have that theatre and the fact that the association didn't start with yes. Gerti. It's something that's yes. come to it yes. uh, uh, later on. The teams um, are now coming from the British Isles era, Europe. But we've also changed insofar as the only time that a local team was brought in was if we had a late withdrawal, then we'd ask a local team would they be prepared. And it was usually a play that they had on the stocks that they'd already done maybe a few weeks earlier. And that's how the amateur local movement started to come into the festival. It's now changed again and local teams can enter from the beginning now. So there we are. That's how things have changed. But in those early days, for some of your listeners, they might remember such people as... Tudor players from Manchester, very mm -hmm. popular team. Uh, the London Group Theatre, Martello were from ERA, Sedgefield, University Players Hamburg. And these teams were all winners and included only two Manx teams to ever win the Legion. Win, win. One was the Legion players and the other was the Russian players. And I'm very proud to say that I was in the Legion players winning play. I was a, a young lad in those days and playing the juvenile lead. The play was called Angels and Love. And boy, did we enjoy winning that. <laughs> <laughs> and that first podcast featuring Michael will be available for download early in the new year via the Manx Radio website, of course. Or you can subscribe from your favourite podcast provider and get them sent straight to you. Spotlight. Brought to you by the Isle of Man Arts Council. You're listening to Spotlight, Manx Radio's arts programme. And over the last few months, we've been profiling current members of the Isle of Man Arts Council, their background, their interest and thoughts on the council and the council's work itself. This evening, it's the turn of Ben Heath, businessman, actor, restaurateur. I asked him if the arts had always played a part in his life. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I guess from from school up, really, um, particularly from the drama side. And then I, one of the many jobs I've had, I sort of found myself into you know, TV and film world. So you know, involved with um, on the the drama side of that as well. Um, and that's we first met going back into the yes, the multimedia centre when you were training there. Exactly, way way back. Yeah. I don't yeah, I don't care to think about how long ago that was. But yeah, it's um, but I mean, fantastic opportunity that we that we had at the time to you know develop dramas on the island and to bring over a professional crew and to you know to work with lots of different people so yeah i mean going going back all sorts of different ways and then i sort of strayed from for a while and um you know went into into to business i guess but actually you know going back into the amateur theater scene and getting involved in that you know reignited the enjoyment i guess from it as well so which is good and i think there are a few people now on the island who have who have been on both sides of the fence who have worked in the professional market professional scene in the profession as it were yeah and also now come back and you know maybe doing a bit of both or they've perhaps left that moved on and have gone back to being an amateur again or working in the amateur scene absolutely and i you know i know i know you know many people that uh have had opportunities to you know to to take parts and to perform in front of you know large audiences you know frankly they would never have had because you know very few people in their career get to play the breadth of parts that we have the opportunity to over here um and and certainly wouldn't have done probably in a in a professional you know environment so yeah it's one of the ways that we're so so fortunate over here to have those opportunities i think and do you think the standards very high here because it's quite often said that you know, the only real the only difference between an amateur and a professional should really be that the professional gets paid for it and the amateur doesn't yeah i mean i think that's very true i think um Particularly over the last couple of years, you know, st standard continues to grow. Um, 
Uh, I mean, uh, some productions that I've seen this year. I mean, I I am usually <laughs> pretty critical, I've got to say. Um, uh, but there are some productions that I've seen this year that really were pretty faultless, to be honest with you. I mean, and, and, and really, really genuinely could hold their own amongst you know anything that was happening within the UK. Yeah, and I think certainly for me that's very much the case when you see some of these ones. And as you as you hinted at there, I do sometimes wonder whether people on the Isle of Man realise how lucky we are with with the facilities we've got, with the wonderful Gaiety Theatre, and the pool of talent here. I think sometimes we we somewhat take it for granted what we've got here. I, I agree. I mean, I think it's very easy to, and, and I think that's one of the you know the great opportunities for for people when they do leave the island. Mm. Um, uh, you know, I had the opportunity to to work with Madfer and to go and play with some, you know, in some other smaller theatres, you know, across the country. And you, you know, you walk into a uh, a shed somewhere, which is a local theatre, uh, you know, with three lights and a and a man behind the bar, and you kind of, you know, and that's that's where local theatre is done within the UK. You know, and we get the fam- you know, fantastic Gaiety Theatre among some of the other venues as well. I mean, we've got fantastic smaller venues across the island as well, which are, you know still putting on fantastic theatre and fantastic, you know, musical events as well. And man for the, the Amateur Drama Federation, was that your sort of way heading towards the, the, your Arts Council role now, or how did that come about? Yeah, I, su- I suppose so. So I, I joined um, at, a, at a time when Manfred was going through a bit of a transition and went in um, as, as finance role, so I, I went in as, as treasurer for them. Um, they, you know, the... the, the circuit around the UK and the, around the theatre festivals is really struggling. It has for, for some time. So for us to still have Mad Fun for them to be putting on, um, you know, the level of productions that they're doing is still, you know, an absolute gift because it's really tough. I mean, it's, it's been tough for all of those festivals in, in the UK. Um, but a lot of learning there and a lot of learning about other societies and getting involved with, with those processes. So I, I guess, yeah, it was a good introduction to Arts Council. And Mad for another one, again, one of those sort of organisations which... A lot of people might not have heard of do so much work behind the scenes for the amateur dramatic scene on the Isle of Man and for teams coming across here and the festivals and such like. The Arts Council itself, where you are now in a current term, um, I've been asking the people again when we've been talking to the various members, what, what do you see as the, as the role and the position of the Arts Council on the Isle of Man? I mean... Essentially, the reason I went into it and, and the, the core foundation for me is to enable creative projects that perhaps wouldn't otherwise have um, the opportunity to be seen by audiences. Uh, we have, you know, increasingly in, you know, in the world that there's, there's a more and more commercial view to everything that, that has to happen. And that's due to all sorts of different pressures that are put onto it. And Arts Council's role there really is to to support and champion projects that otherwise would find it very challenging to find audiences. We are still... A small community, um, so you know certain projects that would that would see uh, audiences within the UK around much larger, much larger areas. You know they just don't have the opportunities here. It doesn't make them any less valid, and it doesn't make you mean that the people involved in them don't deserve the chances to you know to show their to show their hard work. So I think it's to you know it, it's really to provide audiences to to productions and artistic projects that otherwise wouldn't see the light of day. And so do members within the council have their own specialties? Yeah, they do. I mean, it's a really diverse group of people. I often kind of feel, I think, a little bit like the fraud on the council because we have some incredibly talented people that are involved daily within the creative arts. So I'm some, sometimes the one that sits there in the background and just goes, well, you know, you guys you know, really know what you're talking about, whereas I just pretend to. But... Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a really diverse set of skills, but it's super productive, you know, and I've sat on, you know, through through work and and through all sorts of different things, lots and lots of different committees and lots of councils and things like that. But there is a genuine will from absolutely everybody on the council to really do the best that they can and champion the creative arts within the island as much as they're possible. And I know when we were talking to Jane earlier on, I think we were profiling her, she was saying that, yes, you've been the lead on this new creative industries funding, which has been in place, what, the last six months, a year? How long has that been going? Well, it's brand new. So we we just literally gave out our yeah. first two awards. So um, it's 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 very young. Um, so it's really nice to be able to bring that that forward and to, to enable different kinds of awards to be given out, I think. One of the challenges we have and have had on council is that um, we really have two main funding streams, which is underwriting and then a grant as well that we can give out to people. We've sometimes run into difficulties in terms of long conversations around, well, what if somebody 
actually wants to make some money out of it at the end of it. You know, the grant funding that is there is to enable a creative project for it to come to a conclusion and to put the funding in to make sure that it, it actually happens. But, you know, we've had circumstances where you, you, an artist wants to purchase a piece of equipment and at the end of it, the hope is that they will sell their work. And that's always sat in a strange space for Arts Council in the sense of, well, do they, do they then repay that money or, you know, how does that really work? And I think the conclusion that we came to after you know, hours of conversation is, well if somebody within the creative industry actually makes some money out of it, is that the worst thing in the world? And we just need to develop a, you know, a funding stream that specifically enables that to happen. And then all sorts of good things we hope can happen around it. So you know, growth within the creative industries and to help some people to may take that leap from perhaps what is a, you know, a hobby or something that they do on a small scale at the weekend into something larger that they can share with more people. And you're saying first two just given out. Has it been good uptake? It has. I mean, I think so. We've had uh, six applications in so far. Um, we've awarded two and the rest are, are still in discussion at the moment. Uh, I mean, it's fair to say, as a council, we're still finding our way through this project It's and, and through the funding scheme and we're taking feedback from people that are applying. Essentially, the basis of the application is built around a business plan. So getting, you know, getting that amount out of information out of people. And it's it's on us to make that process as easy as we can to try and help them to extract the information so we can, you know, then make, make the right decision. But I think as we start to see more work through the system, hopefully we'll see some more, you know, people come out as well. Um, uh, yeah. yeah. And who who actually can apply then? Someone's listening to this thinking, well, oh, this sounds, you know, it could be in my bag. Who can actually or is entitled to apply? So we've tried to keep it as open as we possibly can. So it's targeted around either what we would call the startup space or the scale up space. So that could be a company that is brand new or it could be a, you know, a, a sole trader or um, somebody that does something as a hobby at the moment that has, you know, little business experience or hasn't done anything commercially before. Or it could be a creative industry that's already pretty well established and wants to diversify into something else we as with all of this type of funding so funding that goes into new businesses you know inherently it is it is pretty risky and, and we've we've taken that view to um, make the you know make the application process as easy as we can make it we understand that not all of these will be absolutely a success um, but we're hoping that some of them will be and it's still you know an absolutely super valid reason to go out there and try and support these industries to bring them further forward and contact in the first instance if the people are interested in applying for this via the website is it yeah um, and then after that i would really encourage them to go and speak to you know the fantastic arts team about it as well go and just talk through the application um arts council essentially is there to try and say yes to as many people as they possibly can they want to try and and provide funding and you know particularly with this scheme to as many different companies um, and entities and mm. projects as they possibly can that is really down to ultimately at the end of the day the quality of the application so the more that we can be provided within the application the easier it is for us to say yes and the best place to start with that is information on the website and then to go and you know chat with the team if there's anything in there that they think they need more clarity on and is there specific windows for applying for this or is it sort of open throughout the year yeah so we sit within it sits within our normal funding rounds so we have four funding rounds a year so um there's you know th what that hopefully means is you're never too far away from being by the time you've put the application together you're never too far away from it going to council and then being heard and we're you know we're also open to if there isn't quite enough information there in order to make a decision we'll go and push back and say well if you can provide us a little bit more that from from that and then we can uh, usually do and adopt something outside of the meetings as well so you know trying to be as flexible for people as we possibly can i guess sounds a great scheme a great hope for 2023 of course uh yourself how long is your term on the on the council i have i think another two years or just under two years coming up um then so it's yeah it's a five-year term so um, but time flies it really does enjoyable yeah really enjoyable as i said it's it's a really great group of people and a couple of people have changed in my time while they've been there but um really really productive and uh, collaborative in trying to you know get as much funding out to people as we possibly can so yeah very enjoyable terrific stuff and, and just finally do you think the arts council have been around for a long time there have been lots of you say really really talented people in, in all sorts of spheres involved in it over the years do you think it's actually well well known enough on the other man does it have, have a high enough profile I think the team have done a great job in, um, you know, in recent history uh, of of really starting to to push the message out. There's always more that can be done, but you know, a lot of focus on on social media and um, sharing uh, the information around creative industries and and you know and and the creative projects that are that are there. Uh, 
I do think it's one of those things, like so many things on the Isle of Man, that that just sort of sit there in the background yeah. um, and quietly sort of push out um, information and push out funding to enable it. And, you know, I'm sure lots of people, everybody listening to this will have benefited at some point from an Arts Council funded or supported event. Um, and, and, you know, that's fine. Well, that's what we're there to do. We're there to sit in the background slightly to to push the funding out there to enable, you know, the real creatives to take centre stage. And I'm, you know, I'm fine with that. Great talking today. Onwards and upwards with the Arts Council. And uh, yeah, Merry Christmas. Thank you so much. And to you. And we'll be continuing our profiling of Arts Council members next year. Is it performance art, street theatre, busking? Who knows? The White Boys has been part of a Manx Christmas for over 200 years. Albeit, there seems to have been a 30-odd year hiatus in recent times. Happily, it's back with a vengeance. But what's it all about? A question we've all been asking for decades, it seems. And if anyone might know, the answer could be with one of these two long-time exponents of the art, Nicola Toombs and Phil Gorn. So, Nicola, spill the beans. What is the white boys all about well first of all the white boys they're named for the white costumes that they wore i imagine back in uh years ago it was just pragmatic they probably just had big white sheets that they could repurpose for their costumes so they became known as the white boys because of the the white costumes we know that the very the first written um instance of the white boys is 200 years ago in 1832 in the newspapers it's written about so we know it's been going for at least 200 years at, at, at least on the island and it it comes from this sort of idea that around the foolish fortnight around christmas time you would indulge in all of these fun activities like christmas carol singing hunt the wren all of these sort of fun things that invariably involve going out, having a bit of fun, entertaining people, gathering in a little bit of money, and uh, and the White Boys is part of that tradition, really. You're nodding your head, Phil. Is that the way you see it as well? Well, I, I tend not to see these things uh, at all. Um, uh, uh, Annie Kizik, um, um, my research department, does all, all my uh, thinking uh, on these topics. It appears to be a, a kind of a, a, a variant of ve- various mummers' plays that have been uh, performed all over the British Isles. Um, but some interesting little glimpses in, in our versions. So, for example, at one point... Uh, the King of Egypt, in, in the version that has the King of Egypt, says, Oh no, we are all brothers. Why should we be all through others? Well, all through others is a direct, direct link uh, or lift from mm. uh, for the Kalia, which is a Manx Gaelic term. And, and I, I don't think we've been able to find all through others anywhere else in, in any of the other white boys plays that are performed uh, in England, Ireland, Scotland. Um, so it, it, it gives us a, a fair indication that the White Boys has been around for quite a while and it has been influenced by the Manx language. Because, again, that might be a, a thing that people would be thinking, well, OK, 200 years ago, what were they all doing spouting uh, English plays if most people spoke Manx? Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, it, it, interesting. I mean, it is. It's fascinating stuff. And uh, but, but for me, the history of the White Boys is my, I think, great-great-grandfather uh, was the doctor. My dad was the doctor. Uh, I was the king of Egypt in the play uh, at, uh, at, that we did at uh, Arbury Primary School. And uh, I now, um, seem, because I, 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 I organise it, I, I get to pick the best part. So I'm, I'm the doctor primarily um, when we do the White Boys. And I'm glad to say both White Boys teams have been out and about this Christmas. What a great custom. If completely mad. And you can hear more from Nick and Phil on a Memories of Man special about the White Boys, which will be broadcast 12.30 on the 29th of December. Tune in. That's about it for this week and this year. Thanks ever so much for your company. Stay tuned in 2023. And don't forget, if you want to hear anything again, go to manxradio.com, download the Spotlight podcast, listen where you want. Why not try it whilst roasting your nuts on an open fire? Just beware of those stray sparks. We'll be back next year 
with a look back at 2022. Until then, a very merry and creative Christmas and an artful New Year to you all. Cheerio.